I was asked the other day by a CEO, he said, Keith, in your opinion, what is the most important leadership trait or characteristic needed to navigate the future? And of course, my answer is entirely debatable, but it was one I gave without hesitation adaptive intelligence. I do not know how we as organizations, how you as leaders will negotiate the future without huge spades of adaptive intelligence. If you then say, well, let's, what is adaptive intelligence? It's a fancy signing word. Let me try and give you some handles to this thing that we call adaptive intelligence. We know that it's important. Borrowing from Darwin, it's not the people that have the biggest market share or the strongest or the fittest that survive change. It's those that are most adaptable. You've seen that corporate case studies are littered with companies that were so arrogant because they had the dominant share of the market that they're no longer in existence today. Kodak, etc., etc. There are corporate case studies of people who say, we don't need to change, look at us, we're dominant. This market will never change and change happened like that. So don't think that longevity and market share are going to preclude you from change in the future. We know that. You said, Keith, well, help me understand what adaptive intelligence is. I want to give you these four things. Let me tell you the story, how I came across this. When I started realizing adaptive intelligence was important, there's not a lot on the bookshelves around it. There's a lot on adaption and flexibility, but it doesn't go deep enough to what I was looking for. And I did a search on adaptive intelligence and came across two marine biologists by the name of Gunderson and Holling who looked at the ability of coral reefs in the Pacific to adapt to changing oceanic conditions. And based on their research, those are four points that they articulated that have nothing to do with the corporate world. But I think as you look at them, you'll agree they have everything to do with the corporate world. It comes from marine biology. But I looked at that and I said, gosh, I could build a whole program around that. We could spend a day looking at those four things. Some years ago, I was talking to the ex-chairman of Unilever in South Africa, a very prestigious position, big company. And if you get to be a national chairman, you're a big cheese. And uh, I said to him, what is the greatest leadership lesson in his role as chairman that he had ever learned? And I'll never forget the story he told me. He said, well, Keith, a couple of years ago, I got an email from our head office in London that it was instructing me to attend a chairman's conference in a few months' time. And it was, um, it was basically a date and a destination and a time. And I looked at the address and it was an intersection in New York City. Be there at this time. He said, I realized that part of the email had got mislaid. This is ridiculous. You can't just issue this. So I said to my PA, please find out the rest of the story because he was about to go away. He said, I got back from my trip and I said to her, and? And she said, sorry, sir, that's it. He said, I was furious. I got on the phone to London. I said, this is ridiculous. I need more information. If I'm going to attend a chairman's conference, international chairman's conference, I need the agenda. I, want, I, I need more information. He said, I got stonewalled. He said, I got so angry. He says, looking back, my anger was a mask for this fear that I started to feel because I didn't have control. I didn't have information. Anyway, the story goes that he got nothing. That was it. Be there at this time with those kind of logistics. And he said, I was so nervous. I checked in a day ahead of the schedule to a nearby hotel just to kind of see what was going on. <laughs> so he said, when the time came, I was actually better prepared. I changed down, I tried. He said, I had colleagues who had made long trips from all over the world who arrived at JFK and were getting out of taxis in the heart of Manhattan with their Gucci luggage and we were standing. These are chairmen of Unilevers around that world. He said it was a sight to behold. He said, the, you can imagine the grumbling. You don't treat me like this. I'm used to chauffeur-driven, five-star hotel kind of stuff, you know. Here they were. He said part of the trip ended up them marching across the beach carrying their luggage. Suits rolled up. He said it was mayhem. Here was the lesson. Unilever decided to have an international chairman's conference around leading basically in a changing world, adapting to a changing world. And their HR team in London with external consultants said we can either put the guys, the folk in a five-star hotel and theorize it for three days, or we can give them an experiential understanding of what it's going to take. And very bravely at that level of the organization, they chose the experiential part. But when I said to him, what was the most significant that was the story he gave me. Here's my opinion. We have made learning too safe, too comfortable, and too cozy because we are fearful of the backlash of what it means. I think if we are going to help our people live with change and uncertainty right infused into our training and development processes, we've got to learn what that means and how to embrace it. And of course, there are different tolerant levels. I get that. 
But what does that look like? So, you want to be adaptively intelligent. How do you reflect living with change and uncertainty? in your team, in your organization, in the things you're responsible for. How do you start combining different types of knowledge for learning? We're used to the teacher tell, and you saw what happened when that suddenly broke this morning. But there's a whole array of different ways of communicating information. What does self-organization look like? You started to do that this morning. You started to self-organize, and therein sits a huge level of confidence. You gave yourself quite a good pass mark today. That's how I read it. We were making progress. We, how do we allow self-organization? Because that leads to sustainability. And then how do we nurture diversity for resilience? Now, this is a critical point. If I came to you and said, do you want a resilient company? Resilience being defined as the ability to bounce back. Which one of you would say, I don't think that's important? If I came to you as a parent and I said, do you want resilient children? Which one of you as a parent would say, I don't think that's important. I think resilience is probably one of the most important characteristics we can give to our children because we're not always going to be there to pick them up. They are going to have to pick themselves up at some <coughs> point. So let's look into resilience. Werner and Smith were two sociologists who did a, the, most, um, the most prolonged study on resilience that I'm aware of. It took over 40 years. They did it in Hawaii, of all places, and their research was this. They tracked kids who grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. That was their sample group, and they tracked them into adulthood. And they asked this question, why, given a real rough start in life, and similar conditions does one sibling rise to the top and the other sibling end up in jail. They both had a rough start, they both had the same opportunity, the same restrictions and constrictions. Why does one succeed and one not? That was the sample of their research. It was a longitudinal study on resilience. Look what they came up with. And again, you could spend a whole educational process looking at those individual traits, on, but here are the ones I'm interested in. I'm interested in environmental traits. So think about the JL group. If you want a resilient group, look at what you've got to do. You've got to have caring relationships, high expectations and opportunities to participate. Now, again, let's pause. Because whenever you speak about the need to be empathetic and caring, most leaders today roll their eyes in cynicism and they say, yeah, that's again, that's the HR stuff. I'll do that if I feel like I need to earn some brownie points, but I'm going to drive the business hard. The two reasons why I say you cannot afford to ignore relationships in business as a leader is one, because of the connection economy. Because in the future, your competitive advantage is going to hinge on your ability to connect. There's one very solid motivation as to why you pay attention to relationships in business. And here's the other one. Do you want resilience? Well, then you need caring relationships. If a leader doesn't get it after those two platforms and arguments, then I give up. I don't know what to do. And for too long, this kind of caring, empathetic approach to business has been driven from a soft side, from an HR side. It's not. It's central to leadership and core to business uh, effectiveness. When people hear caring relationships, they often, as I said earlier, think that that is excusing any behavior. Not so. The flip side to caring relationships is high expectations. And therein sits the balance. And then opportunities to participate. Any comment? Because for me that starts earthing when we talk about adaptive intelligence, what it is, and what resilience is, it starts giving us something practical. You want resilient kids, you want a resilient team, you want a resilient company, there's a bit of a blueprint.